the platform, but then you see your 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 background, and I was like, yep. how does this guy manage his time? How do I you- haven't slept since the late to mid nineties, probably. <laughs> um, Hello and welcome to the Scripted Podcast. My name is John Parr and I'm joined by... Kevin O'Connor. All right, Kevin, we are back. It is spring. Uh, I believe on the end of the last episode, I made a promise to you that we would that we would only have another podcast if I met a certain condition. I'm happy to tell you that I have watched MacGruber. Oh, really? Yes. I watched it on your birthday in, in oh, memory. Wow. Um, <laughs> in memory of me, <laughs> R.I.P. Kevin. But, uh, uh, I mean, immediate thoughts. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so here's the best part. Despite preparing this idea that I was going to tell you this in the intro in advance, I had not prepared any comments beyond that. But what I will say is, uh, loved it. Um, it's fantastic. I am not in the uh, say cult follower. Uh, okay category that say you and and michael n from the previous podcast are uh i think that that probably is born from people that saw it when it dropped uh possibly maybe you just need like 10 more viewing that so that may also be there. what i will You'll say see. is way better than an snl derived film than it has any right to be Oh, absolutely. Like it's Put that's it. get the skits from the original from SNL are nowhere near touching like what this film is. Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, you can say like there's SNL produced films like Tommy Boy that are great, but very rarely spawning from an actual sketch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, you know, like Coneheads. What, what are we talking here? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. Cone, no, Coneheads is a perfect example of that is the SNL sketch movie. This is like yeah, another yeah. beast. This takes on like every action film ever. So I just wanted right. to add on. Yes, I've seen it. I'm I'm part of Team McGruber. We'll talk about it again. Appreciate maybe that. maybe from every episode moving forward. Uh, from this one, we will start asking guests whether or not they've seen it and recommend it. But I like today idea. we're going to kind of, we're going to pivot a little bit from that, or maybe not so much because we're going to be talking a little bit America today. We're going to be talking, uh, a bit about politics and writing, and we're going to have Michael Schlossberg on the podcast today. And he is a representative of Pennsylvania, uh, which is our home state. Uh, mm-hmm. and he's going to be talking a little bit about his experience on the platform, uh, Michael uh, Michael Schlossberg has been just on a, a crazy rise unscripted, just taking on tons of work, delivering high quality, uh, and I'm super thrilled to talk to him. Yeah, I'm excited too. Uh, and yeah, he's very MacGruber like in the fact that he just does everything, and he does it at like the highest level. That's, that's very true. Very true. <laughs> I'm sure. He, I think he. I think he'll appreciate that. Compared. Yeah, I think he would. Let's jump into it. Let's do it. Michael, welcome to the show. Glad Thanks to be here. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So uh, why don't you tell uh, the audience a little bit about yourself, uh, first off? And first. Sure. So um, my name is Mike Schlossberg. I live in South Whitehall, Pennsylvania. Now, my full-time job is, <laughs> ironically enough, I do a lot of interviews My full for my full-time job. I'm actually a Pennsylvania state representative, so that's what I do for a living. So full-time, I serve the people of Allentown and South Whitehall as their uh, representative in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Um, on the side, I also will, have, I've done fiction and nonfiction writing in the past. I've had uh, eight, one fiction book and one nonfiction book published with more coming. Uh, and I started to do scripted really more than anything else as a way of kind of keeping my skills sharp. And it's something that I've really come to enjoy, particularly as I don't want to call it a hobby because that diminishes the work that we do, which I do really think has value. But it's almost it, it's become another passion project of mine, I would say. Yeah, interesting. We were I was curious about that myself when you came mm-hmm. on and you've yep. been an incredible writer on the platform. But then you see your 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 background. And I was like, yep. how does this guy manage his time? How do I you- haven't slept since the late to mid 90s. probably. <laughs> um, 
And that's well, and that's important because you know, as much as I love scripted, there's no question. Of course, my full time job is serving as a state representative and making sure I'm fulfilling the needs of my constituents and all sure. that. And that is a, a very full time job. But the truth is that some people, and I'd like to think I'm one of them, enjoy what they do for work. And to a large extent, this is something I, I don't want to say that I do it for fun. Because again, right, that finishes right. the work, but it's something that I've truly come to enjoy. And I've come to enjoy it from the perspective of, as someone who's always loved writing, I've loved writing since I was a little kid. It gives me the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's actually, believe it or not, it's been very interesting for my full-time job. Uh, and I'll use this as an example. I've done a lot of writing on CBD and other healthcare related issues in particular. Right, right. And in the course of doing writing on CBD, I've become somewhat of an expert on the subject. And that has then had applications for my full-time job because it's a very controversial issue within this world. Kratom is another example. I've done writing on Kratom, and that's helped to give me a better idea of what the substance is <clears throat> and potential interactions with state government. Um, the real, my, real, my, my passion in public policy has been mental health. Right. So whenever there's a mental health related article, I grab it as quickly as possible. That one truly more than any other article, because that's why I've, I've been very open in my, my career as an elected official, someone who suffered from depression and anxiety. Yeah. And I use my mental health experience in the public policy arena. And that obviously has some very interesting overlaps as you do writing for organizations that are involved in mental health and addiction treatment. Fascinating. And that's so great to hear as well, yeah. especially, I mean, first of all, mental health in the United States in general is, is getting worse. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a little bit of background too. both Kevin and I are Pennsylvania natives. Oh, uh, no kidding. Where uh, from? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. now I'm from Bucks County. Kevin, are yep, you I'm also from, from Bucks? I'm also from Bucks. Okay. County. So there we're both go. from Bucks County. Uh, and yeah, I grew up there, lived there until I was about 21, then lived in Minneapolis, then San Francisco, then Tokyo, then San Francisco, down back That's to Minneapolis. Interesting. It is. But <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you know, obviously Pennsylvania near and dear to my heart. I know, uh, Kevin, you lived there until when? Yeah, until like early 20s, like 23, sure. and then I moved to Las Vegas for oh. about 11 years, and now I'm out in Colorado. Good for uh, you guys. Outside of Denver. Jeez. Uh, yeah, that no, but not... we were excited. I mean, here we yeah, go, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're... I know plenty of people from Bucks County, and I work and serve with them on a regular basis. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, which brings us, like, actually, we want to learn a little bit more about your day-to-day, -day because obviously you're a very busy man, yes. and you do, you do a lot, but I don't think a lot of people know what, a U.S. representative's day yeah. is like. And, which, well, and which... I have to be honest, one of the reasons I really love this job is because no day looks the same. Every day is very, very different. Um, right. And I will, you know what, I'll, I'll use my schedule today. So today, I'm going to pull up my calendar here. Um, I wait, I've always been an early riser. I wake up probably around five 30 in the morning. Um, some mornings I'll get to the gym, not as many as I wish I did, but that's five 30 in the morning is actually my scripted time. And you can ask the poor, poor editors who have the misfortune of working with me that they will get articles <laughs> from me at six, seven in the morning. Right. So that's usually scripted time today. I had a meeting at nine o'clock with a nonprofit that's deeply involved in the Allentown school districts. One of the two school districts that I serve uh, and trying to make kids career ready I uh, had a meeting at 1130 with a couple of local doctors. This is more or less lunch. Ten minutes beforehand, I was jamming a sandwich down my throat. Two o'clock, a meeting with um, a Democratic candidate for lieutenant governor. At three o'clock, I'm going over to our local Jewish community center to celebrate Israel's anniversary as a country. And then at 530, I'm traveling to Monroe County for a uh, panel discussion and screening of a, of a suicide prevention related film. And then I'll probably be waddling back in the door at nine. And, and, and I will say that that's, oh. and that's what it is. But and I will say that that's a typical day in that it represents the randomness of my day. Um, and this is obviously I'm home today. Right. Um, when I'm in Harrisburg, the day gets even crazier. Harrisburg, be it for those of you who are listening, who don't Harrisburg is the Pennsylvania state capital. We're in session twenty to twenty five weeks a year, three days a week. There's a lot of other random travel. Um, as well. So decent amount of time on the road. And those days get even crazier because when you're in Harrisburg, everything gets really, really condensed. Um, and that's that 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 makes life even more interesting. I joke with my staff that I feel like a pinball sometimes. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. I mean, uh, in fact, I feel like 
people who use the term that they are busy are, are maybe uh, kind of overstating it in comparison. This is, I, but I will say this though: it is feast or famine. This is April to June is typically our busiest months. Um, especially because you have to deal with the state budget, which is due by the month of June. So in the month of June, you, I, I joke with my wife that, um, you know, I, I turn into a ghost and spend most of the month of June in Harrisburg. Right. But summers typically are a little bit slower. And I think they can it, – it, an unfortunate habit I think some have is, oh, it's, it, it's summer, so it's slow. And it is slower. Mm-hmm. But you need to keep yourself busy to do this job right. So, like, over the summer, I will typically start knocking on people's doors, on my constituents' doors, just say, hi, I'm here, just want to introduce mm-hmm. myself and, you know, talk with folks. And that keeps you connected to people. And, you know, if you're in this job, hopefully you're a people person. And I- I've always enjoyed that aspect of it, going door to door and actually having conversations with constituents. That's that's the fun part of this job. Uh, it's beautiful to hear that uh, people are still doing the door to door. I, I, well, you can't. If, if anybody and my colleagues and I have this conversation all the time, Twitter is not the real world. Social media is not the real world, and I'm an obsessive social media user. But it presents a skewed platform, and you actually have to make an effort to talk to people to make sure you keep in touch with their needs and find out if there's anything that they need state government help with. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, and, and it's so good to hear that, uh, especially the, the, the concept about social media not being the real yes. world. Let's let's take it back though. So how did you get started? How did you how did you end up in this position? In government, you mean? Yeah, the whole story. Yeah, that's I'm a I huge hear. masochist. I'm, I'm a huge, <laughs> um, no, I I knew from eighth grade on that this was something I wanted to do for a living. Mm. Um, wow. And I took a civics class. I was like, wait, this is fun. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, was it a civics it was class? Just, and, and specifically, it was a model <laughs> congress in eighth grade. I was very lucky. Um, so I participated in this. I was absolutely hooked on government and on elections. I grew up, I joke, my dirty political secretism from the state of New Jersey. Um, and I oh. came to, I came to <laughs> Allentown, Pennsylvania through Muhlenberg College, mm. where I went to school. And senior year, I interned for the woman who I wound up succeeding in the legislature, and it was Jennifer Mann. She is one of my dear friends and mentors, learned a lot about the community, fell in love with Allentown, decided I wanted to stay. Um, and then she I was she, she was very helpful in my career. I got a master's degree in, uh, in political science. Two, I worked for our Chamber of Commerce here. Two years later, I ran for a seat in Allentown City Council, which is a, that, that is a part-time job. Won it. Um, Jen Mann retired in 2012. She said, I've, I've had enough. I'm going to leave this job. You're up. And with her support, I ran and won and I was elected in 2012. And then we, we unfortunately have to run for office every two years, which is way too frequently. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It, you just we, constantly campaign. We looked into that though. No. You haven't had a lot of competition. No. Well, <laughs> and that's actually a, that is a public policy problem and one that will, ch- well, that will change to an extent this year. On one hand, I represent the city of Allentown, which is overwhelmingly democratic. Now that has changed thanks to redistricting. I will mm-hmm. say that the maps that were drawn 10 years ago jammed me in order to shore up Republicans around me. They, it's called. It's the process known as gerrymandering. They put as many mm-hmm. Democrats as humanly possible into my district. My district, on average, performed about 65% Democratic, which meant that if I committed multiple felonies, I would get down to 55% Democratic. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was ridiculous. Now, the new district, the district has changed. And in a good way. Now I go from 67% to 57%. Right. Um, and I have a lot less of the city of Allentown. I have um, in the entire South Whitehall Township, which is actually where I live, and then a piece of another township next door, Upper McCungie Township. Um, and I don't, at the moment, I'm very lucky. I don't have an opponent, but somebody at the primary is in is 12 days from now and someone is going to try to run against me to get enough right in votes that they can get on the ballot so we'll see how that so are they are so the opponent okay i have yeah we have so many questions we were actually sitting here before you hopped on taking a look uh at your district well i'll start with this one one that we were curious about as pennsylvania boys so Mm -hmm. isn't allentown traditionally like blue collar so if it depends, the definition of blue collar should have, at least in my mind, changed. Right. When you hear the phrase blue collar, you're going to think of like steel mill workers. And we're living here in Allentown, which is mm-hmm. actually about Bethlehem and everybody from Allentown <laughs> hates that. <laughs> the thing, it is still largely a blue collar city. However, I will change the definition of blue collar because when you think of blue collar, you think of steel workers or right. coal miners and you think of white people. Right. And I say this as a white person, blue collar still applies, but the people who are blue collar have changed because Allentown is a majority minority city. 
The city is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 something percent Hispanic, about 15 percent African American, mm -hmm. about you know, another five to 10 percent um, Middle Eastern and Asian and the rest white. Right. So it's a very diverse city and growing more diverse all the time. Uh, so I would still call it blue collar. I would just say that blue collar means something different. That's certainly true. I mean, yeah, yeah. We, it's kind of bizarre that in 2022, we still use this really dated concept of yeah. blue collar to begin with. Exactly. Well, and that's so many people refer to like, you know, working class and there were and when a lot of people when you use those terms, a lot of time people will default to white. Yep. And as somebody who represents a heavily minority district, I have to say, no, 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 let's make sure we're clear about what we mean. Yep. And it's funny because my new district changes very significantly in a lot of ways, not the least of which is racial demographics. Mm -hmm. I go from 40 percent Hispanic to 15 percent Hispanic, and I will have more Asian Americans in my new district than African Americans, which is a very, very big switch for me. Yeah. And you said you you said you were meeting later today with a candidate for uh, lieutenant governor, yep. right? Yep. Um, can you talk about your relationship with the governor's Absolutely. office? Um, I'm very lucky. I have a pretty good relationship with the governor. If, you know, if you've been listening, people know that I am a Democrat. Um, the governor of Pennsylvania is Tom Wolf, who's also a Democrat. He is finishing his second and last term. He's term limited, so he can't run for re-election. We are right. going to happen. Not the novelist, right? No, no. Same, there's no E at the end of this guy's name. Um, he gets. I know he gets asked that a lot. I'm. I have a. I have a good relationship with the governor. We have a lot of political overlaps. Um, he's been very good to my district, and I've been able to work closely with him on some some really important issues, including education and mental health, which are the two things I'm most passionate about, and I think matter deeply to my constituents. Right. <clears throat> but he's term limited. So that means that in November, Pennsylvania is electing a new governor. Um, and we also elect a new lieutenant governor because those they it's 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 a dumb system. It really should change. Yeah, I thought it was appointed. Nope, nope. So the governor and the lieutenant governor run, but they run separately, even though they have to serve together. Huh, that crazy. led to a very awkward situation in 2014 where Tom Wolf was elected governor, a uh, state senator from Philadelphia named Mike Stack was the lieutenant governor. But. Stack and Wolf never really got along very well. And then a report came out that Mike Stack and his wife had abused their security and their housekeeping staff. And the governor actually stripped him of both. And then Stack wound up getting destroyed in the 2018 primary by a guy named John Fetterman, who some listeners may know is yeah, the, yeah. the front runner right yep, for, for the United States Senate for the Democratic nomination in Pennsylvania, uh, a, a brand unto himself. Wow. Yes, very much so. Yep. So, uh, so anyway. the, the interesting thing is that the Democratic nominee for governor is going to be Josh Shapiro. He's our attorney general. He's unopposed. It's, mm -hmm. it's a done deal. I think the world of him. He's an unbelievable. He's been an amazing attorney general. He's an incredible candidate. He is a fundraising machine, which we need. But he has said, I want a guy named Austin Davis, who's another state representative from Allegheny County, to be my lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. um, and all, I've endorsed Austin. I support him. He's going to be in Allentown. We're going to introduce him to the mayor of Allentown and hopefully do a little bit of campaigny stuff. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, well, one thing to go back to that, uh, you know, regarding your dirty secret, I think one <laughs> thing that a lot of people probably don't recognize uh, if they haven't lived in Pennsylvania is the weird interplay between Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yes, yeah. sir. I mean, I lived in Bucks County, grew up there, and I went to right high there. school in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. I went to high school in, in Trenton. So, oh, wow. so you know, and then, of course, the classic down the shore and everyone. Yeah, down, be, yes. down the shore. Nobody from Jersey can drive, which I will confirm is true. Um, <laughs> up your own gas, et cetera, et cetera. There, there is, um, you know, and our, our two economies are linked, and Lehigh County isn't quite a border county but it's pretty close yeah yeah so we hear about that all the time and as a as a, i tease uh, people i'm a new jersey refugee that we've uh <laughs> we're a state that is very that should be very grateful for the continued importation of uh of people from other states and frankly from other counties <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah no 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 for sure and so uh, allentown is growing then as well allentown is lehigh county 
was the second fastest growing county in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania at 6%. The eastern part of the state is rapidly growing. The eastern and south central or the north central and west is by and large shrinking. Hmm. And it creates uh, some very interesting dynamics. As I, I mentioned, my district changed, which it has to every 10 years. Part of the reason for the change was because Lehigh County grew so much, and specifically Allentown. Uh, Allentown grew about 6%. Uh, South Whitehall Township, which is the other part of my district right now, grew 10%. I am picking up five-eighths of Upper Mukunji Township, which grew 33%. So we've got really hardcore growth numbers in the area that I live, and it really makes the job a lot more interesting. I bet. Yeah, Yeah. I bet. What a, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Kevin. Yeah, no, speaking of interesting jobs, uh, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about your freelancing career. Yeah. You said you got a couple books published, um, mm-hmm. but before you joined Scripted, were you freelancing? I was. Uh, so <clears throat> I freelance for a different service called Text Broker. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And I will still pick up an assignment from them once in a while. I That was kind of my entry into it. I've enjoyed that platform. I will say I enjoy scripted more because it makes it, I think it's a little bit more user-friendly for both the clients and on my side, certainly for the writer, the editors are so much better to work with. And especially, I really appreciate the editors that are very hands-on. That's not something that I had worked with previously. And Mm -hmm. that not only makes the article better, but as a writer, that makes my writing better. And, you know, hopefully teaches me skills I need in order to continue writing, not just as a freelancer, but I I continue to do creative writing when I can. I will hopefully have another book published within the next, I God, I don't know, the next year or so. The publishing industry (laughs) is, it's, it's slow, but I've got more stuff coming. So... It's, you know, again, just from a selfish perspective, freelancing helps me become a better writer in general. Right. Do you consider yourself a writer first? No, no, I ha- I, I have to be a state referee. Well, for, before I met, <laughs> the obvious without trying to sound trite, before I'm anything else, I'm, uh, I'm a husband and a daddy. Right. Um, but from a professional perspective, the first, the first job as an elected official always has to be being an elected official. That's what... I've signed up for, and that's what people ask of me. Um, The freelancing is partially, you know, a a creative passion, but I, to be perfectly honest, it's been very helpful from a financial perspective. There's, there's no question about it. I, it it really, it's made our lives a lot better. And I clearly appreciate that. (laughs) Hey, that's that's great. great. I I think that, there might be a lot of people listening that are like you that have mm-hmm. full-time positions that are very busy, that have a family, yep. but they have a passion for writing and, and that they're considering like, how do, can I get into freelance writing? Yep. Do you have anything to say to that? Oh, and that's the answer is yes. If you have the right personality traits, I am, I am very organized with what I have to do with deadlines that I have to meet. I know when I have to sit down and do things. And you also, one of the things I realized about scripted right away too is that you have to be able to plan your time. And especially in my job, obviously, I run around like a chicken with my head cut off uh, in my full-time job, which means that I have to plan my time accordingly if I'm going to meet deadlines. And that means that you can't overburden yourself and take on too many assignments at the same time. But as long as you're organized with your time there's and you're a good self-starter, there's no question that you can get work done. There have, like, and, you know, like anybody else, there's been times where I've either taken on too much or gotten articles back and i've had to say okay guys can i get an extension the sure, answer sure, is sure. yes and i appreciate that and clearly as long as you're a writer who doesn't abuse that ability it makes your life better to know that you that n- everything's not set in stone do this or we're going to set you on fire <laughs> exactly these yeah. are the deadlines if there's issues we can accommodate just don't abuse that privilege yeah no and 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 well i would go as far as saying if you can if you in particular can meet these deadlines then i think anyone can oh yeah <laughs> it's and uh it, 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 it's not I, the only people that it's not for is people who aren't self-starters and i would think that right. that's not that wouldn't be good for anybody for the for the person in question or for the client because they couldn't meet the deadlines yeah. i mean I, I and you there have been so many times where i've picked up articles especially for one client in particular I was like hey this guy flaked out. Can you finish it? Yep. yep. And, you know, so I finished the article and that's, you know, hey, that's that that's an easy one for me. I always like doing that. But you've got to have the right personality traits. But if you do and if you're confident in that, this platform can unquestionably help you, you know, be a writer, be a better writer. 
have some, you know, in, in fulfill a passion and make real money on the side. Yeah, that's, I mean, and I, I completely agree. I think a lot of the people who don't have that trade have a tendency to kind of naturally filter themselves out, my experience. Yeah, totally. You know, you just, you really can hang if you can't meet those. Uh, I, I would say, um, and then we have a lot of writers, I think, that are also like you, where they have, you know, another thing that they're doing, many of which are also writing, um, yep. you know, larger, more creative projects. What kind of stuff are you writing? What are you writing about? What are these books? So I write... Um the first book I ever had published was a book called Tweets and Con- and it's an ironic book in retrospect. It was published in 2014, and I say that for a reason. It was a book called Tweets and Consequences, 60 Social Media Disasters in Politics and How to Avoid Making a Career-Ending Mistake. And it is deeply ironic because I wrote it before Trump, who broke every one of my rules. I was going to say, it's not each one. I'm wrong about everything. Just don't read that book. It's really stupid. Don't read that book. Got it all wrong. Um, it needs a new version. But... This second book I wrote was a fiction book, a young adult fiction book called Redemption. And it's got a science fiction twist. 20 teenagers find themselves on a spaceship. They don't know how they got there, but they have to save the world from a deadly plague written before COVID. That's a different story. Um, But the twist on that book is that the main character suffers from depression and anxiety issues and has to engage in all the world saving shenanigans while also fighting off his own demons. So obviously it was inspired by my own personal experiences with depression and anxiety. Yeah, super cool. Um, Yeah, that was a good one. So the sequel is in editing right now, so I'm I'm hoping soon that will be out. I also have another young adult book coming out. This one's probably further away. That was... it, it, it. Well, it was informed by COVID. I had the idea before COVID, and I finished it during COVID. Um, a book. I love dystopian books. You know, yeah. the world is going to end, blah, blah, blah. And then one day as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, what happens if the world doesn't end? And the first scene of this book is the world is, is from the perspective of a teenager at home who's watching Bruce Willis up on the asteroid and they win <laughs> and the world is going to be saved. And it's a now what book? Right. Because I always I always found that circumstance kind of interesting. How scarred is the world after a year of thinking, oh, my God, we're all going to die but the world is saved and then everyone shoots off fireworks and celebrates. And then you have to pick up the pieces of a broken world. That's so true. Yeah. All disaster movies as well. It's like the sheer amount of damage and other things. And then credits roll. Exactly. You're right. There's a whole other story after the credits. Yeah. That's just everybody holding hands. (laughs) Yeah. But it's like, Oh God, we have to go back to work now. Wait a minute. And and then unfortunately we ended up living a little bit of that story. (laughs) We know the reality of it a little bit. I started it before COVID, but then I finished it. I was struggling with it actually. And then I realized I, I was focusing on all the wrong things in the book. So I tweaked it. And then fortunately that, that should be published. I think it's still a ways away. It's still very much at the beginning of the editing process. Sure. And and that book was informed by my own mental health experiences, but not nearly as direct. And that's definitely a theme throughout my writing. We're going to have to eventually dig some spoilers out of you, as apparently there's a prophetic nature to all of the things that you're writing. Completely unintentional. (laughs) Um, Well, I, I will. I will say there was a funny it was a throwaway line, and as a Democrat, it broke my heart to edit in my first book. I make reference to, you know, they're like, the first book takes place in the future, and I make reference to historical film, uh, historical pictures that happened in present day, and I made reference to the female president smiling and waving, Ooh. thinking, like most people did, that Hillary Clinton was going to get elected president yeah. in 2016, and then having to go back and go, <laughs> and then make the edit accordingly. <laughs> One of those random things that you try not to think about. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we still live with the ghost of all of that, right? Oh, now. and we will be for some time. <laughs> yeah. Well, which actually kind of leads me to another question. So, you know, obviously there's only so much you can say, but what are you thinking as far as political ambition for the future? Oh, oh no. Oh, I can happily answer that. Okay. I'm very happy in my current job. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the current. I don't know what oh, the no, status no, 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 is. No, I get it. So I am I am a state representative right now. You know, in theory, if I was more ambitious, I'd either look at running for the state Senate or Congress. Um, I have negative desire to do either of those things. Interesting. Why? I'm, I'm already at the limits of the amount of time that I spend away from home and obviously ah. very busy as it is. I really enjoy the job, 
Plus, you can channel your ambitions elsewhere. I've become the mental health guy in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and it's an issue that has meaning to me, and I've been able to do some good work. Um, I was also last year elected to a House leadership role, which means my colleagues felt that I would, that, um, you know, they, they, I'm the House Democratic Caucus Administrator. It's a position voted on by other colleagues, and that means you help to manage the House Democrats set policy and try to help other people out with some of the things that they're working on. Right. So my, that, that is where my ambition has been channeled and it's given me the opportunity to have more of a voice, at least in part because of that leadership position in last year's budget. I was able to get through a huge uh, boost to education spending, a hundred million dollars to the hundred poor school districts in Pennsylvania, which included my home school district of Allentown. And that was a big deal. This is the longer you're in the legislature, if you're doing it right, the more impactful you should become. I like to think that's where I'm at. So right. I, I don't want to start over anywhere. That's refreshing to hear. I think that there's sort of a perception that all politicians are just driven by this sheer kind of selfish yep. ambition. Oh, totally. You think totally. that's true? And sometimes we bring it upon ourselves. I mean, right. I can't, I can't say that that's not well earned. But, you know, you think about it, though, most of us get to a position and hang out. I mean, in, within the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, I would say 80 percent of the people, this is their their quote unquote highest political stop. And right. there, there will always be people who are more ambitious. And to be clear, like I was a member of Allentown City Council. This was something that I always wanted and I knew it, you know, right. so that's I, I, ambition only becomes a problem when it stops you from doing the job the right way. And I hope that was never me. I don't think it was. Do you think that that's the thing that happens? What, people doing the job the wrong way for ambitious purposes? Yeah, or essentially uh, neglecting it to some degree. Uh, there's no question. Yeah. yeah. And, but usually those people get caught. The public is not nearly as stupid as I think some some elected officials wish it was. Well, it's a black box in a way, you know, I think yeah. for a lot of the general public. I mean, even before we hopped on to do this podcast recording, Kevin and I had to do sort of a civics refresher here. Yeah. <laughs> like we're like, wait a minute, does he? Do you report to the governor? Is he Who in is Congress? No, 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 no. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of that. Um, there's also just, I guess, maybe even the bizarre chain of things that leads up to say, like the Senate or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, how often do you interact with those kind of guys? Like, uh, so the gu you don't usually personally interact with the governor. Um, I do from time to time. Either I'll see him at events, or he'll come yeah. into my district. Um, and then during budget time, I typically work with him a little bit closer. Um, you interact with the governor's staff on a pretty regular basis. I will say, well, at least if you're of the same party, if you're of different parties, hopefully you do as well, right. but it's certainly more of a challenge then, especially if you're fighting directly over some public policy issue. Um, the Senate, again, it depends. Yeah. I work pretty closely with my state Senator on a couple of issues and for, we're actually a different, he's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. We've been able to get along relatively well, but That's you also, tip, and it works. But usually, at least, and I am in the minority party here, so we don't pass bills as frequently. So usually when you do work together, it's on outside the building stuff like message coordination right. or, same, or overlapping campaign events, something like that. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so we don't want to keep you much longer. Um, and we really appreciate you coming on and, and, and all the work you do on Scripted. And really happy to hear that not only is it helping you kind of professionally, but it sounds like your writing career is also a therapeutic yeah, use. Deeply. It's the only thing that's kept me sane sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, that's great to hear. And I think uh, a lot of, uh, you know, aspiring writers out there might not really view it that way. Uh, well, and, and it depends on what you do and what you're willing to put in. Like if you just kind of crap out articles and you're not going to get anything out of it, I yeah. try to pay attention. I, I know my biggest problem is that sometimes I won't give articles the proofing that they need. And then an editor will very gently slap my wrist and say, no, no, no. And right. I'm trying to get better at that. Um, but if you do it the right way then this can be really beneficial for your writing. You know, it's not the same thing as creative writing necessarily, but that's not to say that watching for certain keywords when you write isn't important when you write a book or being concise when you're trying to reach, write an article and keep something under a word count. You know, right. real quick, let's let's take it back. I think it's been how many months that you've been unscripted now? I want to say it like December. Yeah. So you have been on just a meteoric rise. You have moved faster <laughs> upwards on the platform, maybe than any writer we've had. I'm oh, wow. pretty sure about that. I've been here about seven years and I, I'm about 100% on that. Now, awesome. what's interesting is given your schedule, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think one thing that we could probably even close this on is I want to know a little bit, what would you recommend to say a writer who's got a family, who's got a job about time management? You seem to have it down to a science and that I, is so hard to do. And I'm lucky that I think I do. And the answer is you, you have, if you don't have the time, you can't do it, but you carve out the time. Like I said, early writing, early morning and late night tends to be my time. Um, you know, late nights, depending on what, on when I can leave on when I have events. Yeah. And then I'll also try to blast out as much as I can over the weekend. Um, but again, that's dependent on my schedule. You have to know your schedule, know what your limits are and go backwards from there. That and makes because sense. I've been able to do that, I think I've been relatively successful. And, you know, I would, I, again, I love you guys and I love this platform, but I would obviously never miss legislative or government duties in order uh, to, of do course. This. Yeah. So you have to, you have to, be disciplined enough. And if this is your first foray into being disciplined, that can work. You just have to start really slow. And the nice thing about platforms like Scripted is that there's no pressure to grab a million articles. Do one article a month. Okay, great, wonderful. Yeah, right. Then you're going to do what you need, and then you can slowly ramp up from there. Right, right. And so do you think that that's sort of how you got to where you were eventually, uh, or where you are presently, is that Absolutely. at one point you just grow, grew and grew and grew this thing until now you've got this schedule every day that you're yep. holding together. Amazing. hundred percent. Yeah. You, you learn, I know I started slowly and, you know, duh. And then you kind of fill up until you go, okay, this is the most that I can do without sacrificing the little shards of my sanity or my actual job performance. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's so hard to do. It's something that I spent a lot of time on in my own life with with managing multiple disciplines at once. And it is yep. very hard to do, but sounds like you've got it in. Sounds like uh, sleep might be a little rare, but... Uh, uh, I've heard of this sleep concept and I'm going to go <laughs> inject the coffee straight into my vein. <laughs> <laughs> John, before we let him go, uh, is there anything uh, you want to ask him about for a Pennsylvania guy who just hasn't been back to Pennsylvania in a while, like... <laughs> For me, uh, you know, how's the pizza? It's really good. It's just, you know, it's like anything else. It, it's it's hit or miss. Uh, <laughs> spoiled, so spoiled. Got, uh, Almost all miss. Yeah. When yeah. You're yeah. You are spoiled, area. my friend. That is- I have to say, Jersey pizza is good. Like, yep, it's true. Something I miss about Jersey. I will say that. See that 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 is a Pennsylvania man answer through and through. So yeah. so rich in delicious pizza options that that he has the yeah. ability and privilege yeah. to be like hit or miss. I'll tell yeah. you, as Kevin was saying a second ago, you go maybe three hours west, and it is miss all the way to the yeah. other coast. Just yeah. a complete miss. Yeah, I, I, I believe that. Yeah, it's it's dark. <laughs> yeah, I, I was home in Philly maybe a few weeks ago, and I think I had pizza within the first twenty four hours just yeah, to get yeah, it. Absolutely, I have to. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Michael, and 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 carving out some time for us. We're thrilled to have you on the platform. It's awesome to talk about talk to a politician who cares, and especially one from our home state. And and just really really grateful to have you on today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, quite a bit there. I am just in awe of the way that this man handles his schedule. Absolutely. I mean, I'd like to think of myself as an organized person, but... Same. I I am... Yeah. Put me to shame. I am thoroughly embarrassed. Just literally a never-ending burning ball of energy. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, yeah, you came in hot, you stayed hot, uh, <laughs> left hot, like, great, riding yeah, all great. the rest of the day today. I'm like, so, so envious, dude. Going to go. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I felt. Oh, I, I have never. I'm on my like fourth coffee, and it's eleven thirty. I have never <laughs> felt like such a schlub in my life. Yeah. Oh, I feel filthy. I, I put. <laughs> uh, a lot of pride into my schedule. I have, I have a day planner. Um, I do stuff in time blocks and I still cannot touch the level of productivity um, that Michael seems to be able to pull here. And again, you know, as I had mentioned before, we even started uh, the chat with him, the quality that he, yeah. he, you know, puts together here is kind of unmatched. Um, yeah. What stuck out to you here? 
I think, I mean, what comes across the most is that he's very passionate about what he's doing, right? So, like, he doesn't have to do this. No. <laughs> he doesn't need to add another thing to his schedule, like waking up at 5.30 and working on scripted articles. <laughs> um, but he does it because he loves to write. Right. And I think it starts there. If you're if you don't love to write, you probably won't be successful as a freelance writer. That's just bottom line. Yeah. And I mean, listen, I love what he's doing um, as a politician regarding mental health. And in a weird way, I kind of feel like listening to him is is quite inspiring because specifically, obviously, a lot of scripted Mm -hmm. writers, a lot of, of writers on the platform love writing that's why they're here that's how they got started but to see the passion in this guy who is also a politician who's also a father also a husband also writing novels and you know we can only really aspire to kind of that level of energy but just kind of a reminder that you know passion has to be kept alive by yourself there and absolutely yeah and i I, you know he started when we asked him why he started freelance writing he started uh or he began saying uh you know to keep his skill sharp right which is a great great thing to do for any writer yeah Uh, absolutely take any job you can get and write um but then uh as we dug deeper and asked him about his uh his novels um we found out that like it was very apparent that or very clear that he made it very clear that uh writing is therapeutic for him and that he writes about mental health. And that's a part of what he does as a state representative. Yeah. Um, yeah we talked about this last informed, time, but there right? is a very, like, and I think um, we talked about on the last podcast, we had mentioned that, you know, whatever your end goal was as a writer does not need to die with your life as a freelance writer. Uh, and in fact can be informed by it and you can kind of sharpen mm-hmm. that blade through it. Um, And then, you know, obviously right here on this show, we have an example of it and really can't hammer that home enough. Like the to stay good at writing, you have to write a lot. And one good way to do that is certainly to Mm -hmm. be a freelance writer. You can also make some money. You know, as Michael was saying, the financial benefits don't go unnoticed, um, but also keeping him sharp enough to continue writing these novels and keeping your head in the game. I think the the fact that we are able to kind of provide that for writers is great. And uh, to see um, someone be able to do that, you know, and put these ideas into practice is is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And you just never know where you're going to find professional or personal growth. And and what you can do is just put yourself out there and, and take what comes. Right. So like, like you said, he started to learn about CBD and that really actually falls in line with his mental health initiatives in his job as a state representative. Like that is almost, it's not completely random. It's, it's something that will come to you as, as a freelance writer, because you're going to find a ton of different topics and subjects that you might end up. Yeah. And it's all about application about too. Like our previous writer, guest had you know? mentioned that, uh, through being a scripted writer for such a long time, he has become just a beast in trivia. And then we have, then we have Michael Schlossberg today talking mm-hmm. about how it kind of informs, um, some of the issues that he's dealing with specifically as a politician. So there's so many benefits that can kind of come from, you know, continuing to feed, um, your craft regularly and then those lead to even more opportunities uh yeah uh, michael schlossberg was was a great guest and uh, i think uh you know who knows at this rate uh that would be our second political guest you know maybe we'll have uncle joe on in a couple weeks we'll see what happens (laughs) yeah yeah okay all right i'll reach out i know Um, some people yeah so (laughs) Once again, thank you for joining us on the Scripted Podcast. Uh, Be sure to like and subscribe uh, and share with your friends and join us next time. 